Welcome to N20XX. This series takes the listener, year by year, into the future. From 2040 to 2195. If you like emerging tech, ecotech, futurism, permaculture, apocalyptic survival scenarios, and disruptive science, sit back and enjoy short stories that showcase my research into how the future may play out. Serial killers beware. Connect link chokers and anklets send alerts to police if they're cracked, removed, or if the wearer dies. Cams and vehicles, on robots, on streetlights, and pretty much everywhere send live feeds to sites accessible to police and citizens. Ubiquitous glasses create encrypted live streams. A.I.S watching streams mark individuals not wearing connect links and those without known DNA. AI can reverse track suspects, patching together video footage, purchase history, auto taxi trip details, and so much more. If someone kills or even attacks another, arrests follow within hours and the evidence will be irrefutable. Citizen sleuths hunt crime over the internet. Drug dealers, human traffickers, online bullies, hate groups, and grifters wake up to arrests when they thought no one was watching. But faked videos, audio, and text of made-up crimes lead to more individuals live streaming themselves to gather foolproof alibi material. If someone knows you carry a personal archiver with you, they're less likely to falsely accuse you. The surveillance arms race is on. The number of crimes decreases, but some places are safer than others. No surprise, crime fighting works better in wealthier and denser areas. Some crimes are on the rise. A condition called Pexin burnout occurs more often. People who've taken Pexin for years and lived normal lives may feel that the medicine doesn't relieve their anguish like before and will up their dosage. Some go berserk, committing suicide or killing, usually those closest to them. More crimes are committed by remote-controlled robots of all types from least standalones able to handle weapons to cheap quadcopters with explosives taped to their undersides. Tessa, now 30 with grey intertwined with black in her curly hair, stands in the employee gate, a tunnel station where cars and light rail drop off and pick up employees. After midnight, most employees wait inside where wide garage doors remain rolled up. People cross the wide platform arriving or leaving. Everyone leaving wears uniforms, but hardly any of them wear similar uniforms. Tessa pulls her coat collars up against the cold. She feels tired but excited. Serena skips out onto the platform and gives Tessa a peck on the cheek. She says, you didn't have to come get me. Tessa says, I wanted to. They stroll to the auto taxi and climb in. As the car drives down the tunnel, Tessa says, they don't give you peeps any kind of reception room? Serena sighs, no. The stones set in her headband glitter with the sweeps of street lights. Sitting ahead above Tessa, Serena's stage makeup seems like way too much. Her lipstick and wide strokes of eyeliner delineate her lips and eyes to the extreme. Tessa says, I'm dying to find out. What's it like? The car leaves the tunnel onto uncovered streets. Serena removes the earrings and places them in a small pouch, saying, I could only use the service corridors and I had to stay in the restaurant. Imagine halls and stairwells of grey brick. I could tell some doors lead to other restaurants because of the smells and crates of food placed in the hall. Tessa says, could you look out through the entrance to the restaurant? Serena says, a little when people came and went but I think they wanted to make it like a restaurant on a street. The door was small and the windows were colored glass. Tessa feels a warm glow as she says, I'm sure they'll start posting what it's like to live in serendipity, eventually. Serena says, they'll make a show about it, life in the neighborhood complex. Tessa says, any other belly dancers? Serena shakes her head. I was the only one. The next day, Serena makes them breakfast. Tessa lives on an entire, renovated floor in a century-old high-rise in old downtown Hartford. Serena without her makeup and layers of glittering jewelry looks earthy and punky, the Serena that Tessa first fell for. They eat and sip coffee. 
When Serena leaves to work at the co-op, she blows Tessa a kiss. In the hall, Tessa kneels and pushes on the wooden plank nearest to the wall. She slides it under the wall, making a gap. Her fingers reach into the gap and she pulls up a section of floor revealing foil sheets. Lifting the foil reveals hundreds of cash cards with $5,000 on each. Though she's turned off the AR tag chips on the cards, it's safer to shield them. Theoretically, someone could figure out a signal that sets cards to factory settings, making them detectable. She takes three cards, securely rewraps the stash, and puts the floor back in place. In her workroom, equipment glints in the light, coming through dirty windows along one wall. Piles of devices lie on a table. She's purchased these to troubleshoot how Medusa, the Shadownet app, runs on them. When people post about bugs and error messages on certain devices, she tries to come across the same problems and fix them. She sits at the table and picks up a protein chip connect link. As a prototype, it doesn't have any housing, just four components mounted to a ring of plastic. She places it in a signal box and switches it on. A transceiver allows her to connect to the link and through AR, sort her way through confounding code. She knows code, but this code is completely foreign to her. Reminding herself not to grind her teeth, she crams a lesson about the computer science behind the code. A transistor is a point where a signal can turn a circuit on or off. In the prototype link, points replace transistors. Depending on the protein in the point, a point can operate in 20 different ways. One point type has six if and then solutions. One point can add or subtract from a signal. She has a long, long way to go before she can adapt Medusa to these new computers, and she needs to hurry. Most new Connect links will probably use some protein chip technology. Tessa sits back on a couch and logs into ruins of Firebend. As a human huntsman named Sir Andrew Blake, she sits up in a bed, tiny by today's standards, and gets to his feet. In the single-room cabin, he dresses, careful to conceal the bags of holding under his woods jacket. He rides his mare through the woods to the waterfront then ties it to a tree and rows a boat to the island castle Loki Fassel, towards a stone dock. Tessa feels queasy. As he nears the island the walls of the castle seem to grow higher and higher. Many fine ships moor next to the dock as well as galleys scarred by war and small sailboats. He ties his rowboat next to a gypsy houseboat and heads for the gate into the city. In a mud-ground market, he walks to Pap's bakery. At the counter that separates the interior from the market a voluptuous, matronly dwarf femme stands at the counter. Sir Andrew steps up and says, I'd like to buy some cakes. The dwarf says, same as last time? Sir Andrew takes out an empty bag of holding and says, yes and please place them in here. Tessa doesn't know how, but somehow she knows the dwarf is a real peep, not an AI even though their encounters have always been brief and business only. The dwarf takes out a small hand-carved box and says, and please put your coin in here. How many will you want? Sir Andrew says, 100. A graphic pops up showing 100 cakes at 10,000 gold each. He taps the coin icon and taps the box. The bags of holding under his jacket wiggle as one million coins leave them. Miniature cakes fly past the dwarf into the bag. On the boat ride back, he dumps the cakes into the water. They float, each one no bigger than a plum. When her character is back in his cabin, Tessa logs out, takes off her headset, and rubs her eyes. It's later than she thought. She'll have to hurry if she's going to bury a stash and get back before Serena comes over. She walks around, first to the bedroom, to change into pants that would hang past her feet if she let them. In her workroom, she pulls the connect link off her ankle and replaces it with one of her alias links. She got her alias links by collecting foldables when she counted bodies for the government in 2043. With some badly made IDs, she exchanged the foldables for links. Connect links are designed to break if removed, but she found ways around that issue. In the bathroom, she puts on a wig cap and then a blonde wig with straight bangs and a bun in the back. Putting on makeup takes the longest. 
Normally not interested in makeup, she taught herself to use it to make her look like a different person. Most hackers ignore non-digital hacks, but seriously, some colored paste can help you just as much as creating fake accounts. A roll of Faraday foil, a signal scrambler, and a folding hand shovel are together on a shelf. She puts them in her bag and puts one arm and her head through the strap so that the bag hangs to her left side. She straps on her stilts. The top straps fit snugly just below her knees. Under her feet, two hollow tubes extend to padded feet inside a pair of shoes. She stands and pulls her pant legs until they drop to the stilt shoes. A foot taller, she puts on a semi-bulletproof, hooded coat that normally would be too long on her but fits when she wears the stilts. In front of a wall mirror, she walks a circle, making sure she passes. Pacing around, she wonders, does she have everything? Is there anything she's forgotten? When she's excited, her eyes blink a lot. She puts on a special pair of glasses that make her eyes look completely different using holographic tech. On the elevator ride to street level, she calls an auto taxi. The car takes her through what used to be an industrial neighborhood. A cold mist descends through the darkness, making halos around the street lights. Near the giantess mega complex and the newer serendipity neighborhood complex, most of the old warehouses have been converted into living spaces. Two-lane roads replace what were four-lane roads. Trees, some showing tiny amounts of spring leaves, fill in the wide spaces between roads and buildings. Two police vans pass. On the next block, a police bot walks among trees, passing from light into shadow. The taxis are clean these days. The news showed the robots that clean them inside and out twice a day. Gone are the days of wondering what the goop on the floor is or pulling a shirt up over her nose to lessen the smell. She hasn't worn this Connect link in at least a year and the user experience it gives her is all out of whack. It makes the taxi turn on the AC. It must have been summer the last time she used it. It shows the time in her AR which is annoying, verging on unnerving at this time. She only has enough time to set up her taser, rear view, and scrambler quick controls in the lower left. The car lets her out. She walks between two buildings where office and storefront doors and windows have been installed. Most of the windows are dark. The sign on a door reads Quest Creations. Other than that, it lacks welcoming elements. All the other doors have large, welcoming signage, hanging plants, benches, or animated screens. She enters and falls back against the door. Stacks of robo-dogs line a wall. Hand over her chest, she takes a deep breath. Their legs are folded up against their sides, for in each stack. The room is otherwise empty. Regaining her balance, she places her hand on her mace. A door in the back opens and a small, old femme walks in briskly carrying a tray case. Her short grey hair is shaped like a helmet. Is she who controls the dwarf in the game? Does she detect that Tessa is short too? With a rusty voice, the femme says, Sir Andrew? Tessa says, on his behalf. The femme says, certainly. She opens up the case and holds it up to Tessa. They both look east when a cop car lets out a single blast of its siren outside. In the tray, rows of cash cards make icons appear in Tessa's AR glasses, crowding her vision, $5,000, $5,000, The femme says, it's $180, $5,000 each. Tessa takes out her foil and says, I'd like to wrap them. The femme says, you can keep the tray. Tessa says, thank you. The femme closes the case and hands it to Tessa. Tessa tears off a sheet of Faraday foil and wraps it around the case. The femme backs up, saying, be glad to do business with you again. Tessa takes the door handle. For sure. Good night. She exits. Outside, ten police stand alone surround her, pointing right arms at her. Even in the dim light, she can see the guns built into their arms. Her head rears back. Is this going to be the end for her? With a man's voice, one police bot says, hands up. 
Don't attempt to run. Tessa looks at the scram icon in her AR lower left. She blinks. Her glasses fill with static. She pulls them off, loses her hold on them, and they drop to the ground. Inwardly she yells, oh no! Five copbots don't move. Three shift back and forth, stuck in mid-movements. Two walk toward her. She runs left, away from the road. Her scrambler will mess with any remote control, live streaming, and device pairing near her. Peep cops must be remotely controlling eight of the bots, but two have her tagged for auto-arrest and give chase. Pop! Pop! Her pant legs jerk fiercely as she runs. Most police shoot tranquilizer darts. With everyone wearing bullet-resistant clothing these days, the bots aim the darts at her extremities. She holds the tray in front of her so the cops can't aim at her arms. But they can catch her and cuff her. Her taze wear coat won't affect them. She hears what sounds like motorcycles colliding and looks back. Eight dog bots take down the two police standalones. Tessa, run. Fucking run. You need to be miles from here. She sprints between buildings and into an alley. Three cop vans wait. Two standalones walk away from her and two others walk toward her. She backs up. If there are any peeps physically present, they will be fighting with scrambled equipment. She hears a crash of metal on metal. It'd suck if her scrambler causes anyone harm. Kneeling behind a hedge, she switches her connect link off. Hackers like to debate if copbots tag perps they see or just tag their connect links. Remaining as still as possible, she catches her breath. She could punch herself for dropping her glasses. That's a fucking great example of why all hackers eventually get caught. Footsteps of the two copbots pass. They must be in auto patrol mode. She should wait, but not too long. After a count to 10, she runs away from the giantess megablock towering over all other buildings. Auto taxis sit in the middle of the road, headlights still on. Her scrambler has a wider range than she calculated for. Though there are countless surveillance cameras on the streets, most of them live stream. Later on, the police may find footage recorded locally only if they're very lucky. She sticks close to the building fronts. A cat darts across the street moaning. Hopefully, Tessa's scrambler isn't triggering the cat's collar to shock it. How sad. Two police sky cranes fly toward her. Oh shit, don't come any nearer. Fear slams down on her excitement. Will the sky cranes crash if they lose signal? She doesn't want to cause one of those to crash. They veer toward where she came from. After a block of abandoned buildings, overgrown lots, and piles of dumped garbage, she runs into a building that seems unoccupied. How does she know? She doesn't. In the cracking and sagging wreckage that once was a living room, she takes the scrambler out of her bag and pulls the battery out. One by one, sirens wind up to high pitches, dozens of them screaming in the night. She can't call Serena without her glasses. Chances are they tagged this counterfeit connect link anyway. Damn. How'd they do it? The only thing with her that touched her real identity are the VR dots. VR dots are supposed to be dumb tech. They only triangulate with each other to help a connect link track body movement. But what if that isn't all they can do? What if VR dots have their own ID tags? Has she been walking around broadcasting a unique tag for years? Her stomach feels hollow and a cold sweat breaks out on her forehead and upper lip. She takes the connect link off, twists it to crack open, and pulls out the tiny battery. She unwraps the tray and slides the connect link in with the cash cards, then rewraps the tray. In the woods behind the house, an old refrigerator lies on its side, just one piece of garbage in a yard full of garbage. She rolls it, lifting one corner of the downward-facing side, pushes the tray under it, and lets it fall back in place. The sirens have died down, but she hears wheels on roads and sky cranes. If VR dots do have IDs, she could show up as soon as someone's connect link comes near. 
It makes her skin crawl. She feels exposed and leashed. She feels physically choked and groans, trying to clear the sensation. Back in the living room, she takes off her coat, stilts, long sleeve shirt, pants, and socks and wraps herself in Faraday foil, starting from her left foot. She pulls a sock over the foil, then the other sock over her wrapped right foot, and then her pants over her foil-wrapped bottom half. She wraps her hands, arms, and upper torso and secures it by putting her long sleeve back on. The foil around her face is going to be a problem. She has to see but half of her VR dots are embedded in her face. She wraps her entire head loosely and puts her hood and coat on. Then she makes a gap by pulling two edges of the wrap apart near her eyes. For certain she stands out now, but is it possible peeps will think she's making a statement? Here in Harford, not the world center of fashion. Even she knows its feeble hopefulness. She sets out walking, always away from the giantess megablock. If only she could just call Serena. Next time she'll bring an extra alias connect link. Next time she'll write down a few numbers, because even if she buys a burner phone, she doesn't know Serena's number to call her. She has to laugh. Her scrambler disabled an entire police team. They'll have her DNA now. All those years of refusing to give up her DNA may have paid off. She laughs again. They shot tranquilizer darts at her stilts. No one knew that would be a good reason to wear stilts. Hoofing through nature's takeover of what was an urban street, one of those deep drilling monstrosities looms over the treetops and sends out a deep tick 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 pulse that she feels in her bones. How far have they drilled down? Three miles? Eight miles? The people living in this area are screwed if companies find rare minerals between that rig and the next. Mining on the moon shows promise. Why don't they do that, instead? Haven't peeps screwed the planet enough? A femme sits on steps, the only remaining part of a house that once stood in the grassy lot. As Tessa nears she sees the femme's clothes and hair show ratty neglect. The femme quivers. Tessa grasps the hard button in her pocket for the taze wear. She slows and calls out as calmly as possible, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you. The femme slowly lifts her head and says, what do you want? Tessa says, my connect link broke. I was wondering if I could use your glasses to make a quick call. The femme smiles and one eyelid slumps. She says, links don't break. Tessa says, mine stopped working. The femme says, what's with all the shiny plastic? Tessa says, thermal. The femme frowns. She says, what do you give me if I let you make a call? Tessa tenses. She has a cash card with $5,000 on it and one she's been using with $403.28 on it. The femme could have a gun. Tessa takes out the card she's been using and says, there's about $5 on this card. The femme tilts her head and scowls. Are you for real? Tessa says, I just want to make a call. The femme dips her head as she shakes it. She raises it again as she takes off her glasses and hands them over. Tessa hands the femme the card and takes the glasses. If they pick up her VR dots through these glasses, which is improbable, it's a chance Tessa will have to take. When she puts the glasses on, the surrounding street fills with AR junk. A soda can marches up and down the street. Golden 3D dollar signs spin in the sky. A pink teddy bear next to the femme curls in a cozy slumber. Tessa looks all the way down and sweeps her eyes up. She blinks on setting, then apps, blinks at search, and a keyboard pops up. She blinks at M, E, D, U. She blinks at Medusa Shadow Net Surfer and installs it. Opening Medusa, she logs in with the longest password she's ever memorized. The femme turns the card over and over examining it. She says, what are you doing? I thought you were making a phone call. Tessa says, I'm looking up my friend's number. She's in her contacts, finds Serena, and blinks at call. Serena answers, what's up? Tessa says, don't go to my place. 
You didn't go to my place, did you? Serena says, no. I'm still at the co-op. Tessa says, I need you to come get me. Serena laughs nervously. You can't call a car? You mean now? Tessa says, no, please. After the call, Tessa uninstalls Medusa, wipes the install history, clears downloads, and gives the glasses back. The femme takes them impatiently and wastes no time walking away. Her skinny legs wobble. On the drive, Serena says, how long do you have to wear that foil? Tessa says, until I figure out my VR dots or the internet goes down. Serena says, isn't tinfoil hat a cliché for conspiracy nuts? Tessa says, that became popular before peeps injected chips in our skin. Protecting your brain from magnetic waves is dumb. Shielding chips in your skin from radio signals isn't without some bearing in physical reality. Serena says, even when you're covered with foil you manage to come off so nerdy. They arrive at Serena's, two rooms and a shared toilet and kitchen on the floor below in an all-femmes building. Tessa stays wrapped in foil. They both sit on Serena's bed. Through her glasses, Serena checks cams at Tessa's place. She says, no one's been there. Everything looks okay. Tessa says, they could be waiting for me. Can I text someone? Serena says, sure, and hands Tessa her glasses. Tessa puts them on. They frost over. She sits like a silver mummy. She finds a contact and texts, hi Merch. Buzz saw here. I need you to help a friend of mine out. She's in your area. Tessa stretches and twists her neck and arms, making the foil crackle. Merch answers, sure thing Buzz. What do they need? Tessa texts, can you pick her up? She can explain. The auto taxi rolls through a dirt alley and stops. The small femme covered all in foil under her jacket and pants jumps out of the car and jogs to Merch who holds a door open. They walk up a steep flight of stairs together. Merch is 24, with a round face and squinty eyes. He leads her up a second, even narrower flight of stairs. He says, so, you've met Buzzsaw? Tessa says, I work for him. Acting caffeinated, he says, and you are? She says, call me June. He opens a door to a large dusty room cluttered with computer equipment and says, have you worked on Medusa? She says, not a lot. Buzz and I are more friends than associates. He says, oh, I see. There aren't any active VR dot sensors up here. I have a Faraday closet back there if you need to adjust your foil. She says, if you wrap your connect link with foil, that would be a huge help. He says, oh, for sure. She holds her hand under a scanner and can see the VR dots under her skin by watching a screen. Merch winces while she cuts into her finger with a pointed blade. With some crisscross slices, she digs out the tiny chip. Using microarm robots, Merch cleans the chip and mounts it on a plate. By scraping it and scan mapping it, he builds a 3D model, involuntarily grunting from time to time. She digs out a second chip and uses his isolated device mounter to throw thousands of signals at it. Once she figures out how to access it through a computer, band-aids on her fingers, she watches the data and says, I haven't found any identifiers yet. But. I think it has writable memory. He looks up abruptly and says, what? She says, I think it's got soft firmware. Merch looks at his hands and rubs his skin like bugs live under it. He says, maybe I should wear some foil. An hour later, he finds what could be chemical sensors on the chip. The hardware reminds him of some medical devices that monitor blood. He says, why would they need that? She thinks for a few seconds and says, to show cops who's on drugs? He says, holy. Oh no! They arrive at Blizzard Tattoo at night, both wrapped in foil. 
Merch says to the owner, thanks for meeting with us after hours. The old guy with a flat head and massive Adam's apple lets them in saying, money talks. The parlor looks like a classic tattoo parlor with the exception that robust butt arms hang from the ceiling over the client chairs and tables. Tessa, aka June, says, you don't have any cams in here? Tattoo guy says, hell no. Don't believe in M. Merch sets up the scanner and tattoo guy deftly plucks the VR chips out from first June's then Merch's skin, 105 chips for each. Reluctantly talkative at first, tattoo guy asks more questions as he works. So, you're not just crazy. Why are you removing the chips? A few minutes later he asks, and you're sure police can know who you are no matter if you wear a face mask or not? Halfway through working on merch, he says, could I use your scanner to remove my VR dots? I'll give you a discount. When the car lets June out in front of Serena's, relieved not to have to wear foil anymore and suffering pin size pains all over, June and merch part ways for the night. Merch says, you'll drop by tomorrow Buzz, I mean June? June nods with outward calm and says, yes, tomorrow. Thank you for listening. I will never run ads on this podcast. Please take the time to rate, review, and subscribe so that more future-minded people can find this show. My landing page is in 20 xxcom There, you can find the companion website to this podcast that includes an illustrated timeline and glossary.